Hi, Dick Rochford here. We're doing the physiology training, part of which is understanding uh, blood gases, at least not from a scientific point of view, but, um, you know, from um, an understanding of why uh, cabin pressure can be so helpful in flying. And uh, Blake has the oximeter on. He's pulling a 91. Uh, that number is the percentage of hemoglobin bonding with oxygen. Now, it's also true oxygen, correction, hemoglobin bonds more readily with uh, CO. And what we're demonstrating here is that with slow, careful breaths, four seconds in, pause, four seconds out, we can drive that uh, hemoglobin number up. And uh, some of you who are in the medical profession may know that if someone is in the hospital, hemoglobin number gets below 90, an alarm goes off, they come in and put oxygen on. Right now we have a cabin altitude of uh, just about 10,000 feet. We're level at 280, and uh, the cabin differential is pretty much max, it's at 5.4. So we're doing as well as we can with the pressure system, yet hemoglobin is still lower than ideally it would be at sea level. If the cabin were to become depressurized, notice we have ECS in normal, which allows a normal amount of volume of air into the cabin. We also have a setting called high and emer, and then we have an inflow valve, which is in open. So if we had smoke in the cabin coming from the engine or something weird like that, we could close the inflow valve by pulling on the shuttle and pulling it out like so. And you can hear the difference in the pressure. And we get a little caution there. The other thing we could do to improve it if we had a minor leak in the cabin and the seal or something is we could go to ECS high. That will increase, roughly double the volume of air coming into the cabin through the vent down by my right ankle. I don't know if you can see that. I got my hand on it here. There's plenty of good warm air coming out of here. We have the temperature control at the 12 o'clock position. I'm going to put the bleed air back to normal because it's kind of noisy. Now then, the only other thing we could do to improve um, you know, our health would be to put on the oxygen mask, which I'm going to demonstrate or at least explain to you. So this is a one-hand quick don mask. You press the red levers together, the straps blow up, ostensibly so you can fit it over your head, but obviously you'd have to re remove your cap, your headset, and glasses if you're wearing them. Now the features of the mask are pretty much universal. This is, if you've ever flown or if you're typed in jets or ever flown jets, you know these masks exist on the bulkheads. There's a face shield uh, clearing a stream of uh, gas there. So the oxygen in the tank is very dry, and it uh, would allow you to, uh, if you were wearing a helmet with a face shield, open this up to keep condensate from forming on the inside of the face shield. General aviators don't use that, so we keep that closed. Under here we have the two um, tabs that we use to uh, allow gas to go into the straps to blow it up. We also have a 100% switch here, right here. We should leave that in 100%, stow it that way, in the event you have smoke with toxicity in the cabin, you won't be breathing that in after you get the mask on. And I do recommend you put the mask to your face first, take a couple of breaths, and then when you're, you know, the lights are back on, remove your headset and hat and so on, blow up the straps and put it on that way. 
Now, if you're going to wear it for a long time, pull your mask, uh, mic, uh, pull your headset mic out and uh, press the mic select button to make it, uh, to switch it to the mask mic, which is in there. But that has a Darth Vader quality to it, so um, and my advice would be to leave your boom mic inside the mask. It'll seal just fine. I've played with that before. The last thing we have here is a press to test, which allows gas to flow to make sure it's turned on and working. And then you have an emergency setting. For those of you who have ever uh, dived with children or uh, new divers, Sometimes folks feel like they're over-breathing the mask, the, uh, the mouthpiece, and so it's the second stage of the regulator can be pushed to allow free flow of, of air, which is what this button here does. All right, so Blake is uh, still running around 92%. So, Blake, I have the radios. Roger. Put this on your face and press it. Breathe slowly. And let's watch the magic. A lot of people doesn't don't believe that this is possible. Um, but oxygen. Very slow, continuous breathing. No holding of the breath. When you see he's up to 98 now. Some of that is the pulse doing that. So the pulse will come down if you if you breathe slowly also. Now, if you're flying a pressurized aircraft, you need this training. It's required for flight. The reg reads, you may not act as pilot in command of an aircraft that's certified above flight level 250 without a physiology sign-off. Any flight instructor can give you that, but I recommend you use your own equipment so you get familiar with it while you're at it. Lastly, the Air Force offers physiology training for the military and through the CAMI group in Oklahoma City of the FAA CAMI, FAA CAMI, you're able to get a billet in one of those classes. You fill out the application, send them a, an application fee, which goes to uh, the training group, and uh, they'll, they'll let you train. It's excellent training, and I'd highly recommend that you do that. And even more than once, if you have time and inclination, it's good, it's good information. Dick Rochford, fly safely. Train often.